now for our second video on gravity. Keeping in mind, remember, gravity is uh, one of the fundamental forces in the universe, and it's a force between any two objects that have mass. And it is the force that dominates interactions uh, over long distances or large scales. So, for example, here in here's a galaxy, and the forces between and a galaxy has hundreds of billions of stars, and the force between stars that are separated by large distances is uh, the force of gravity. That's the only force that really has a strong effect at that distance and over large scale. So, and here we have, you know, collections of, these are all individual galaxies and these forces are dominated, the forces between these galaxies are dominated by gravity. Our solar system, we have the sun at the middle. Gravity is what dominates the solar system. It's what keeps everything moving around the sun. And we're going to look at other ways that we can understand it using Newton's universal law of gravitation, where he first, just by looking at observations of the solar system, um, and depending on some work by people uh, before him, he came up with the universal law of gravitation, which is that the force of gravity between any two objects depends on this constant of proportionality, uh, the mass of the two objects, and the distance between them. And they exert the exact same force on each other, but in opposite directions. So they will exert equal and opposite forces on each other. Um, what we want to do now is be able to write this in terms of energy. So let's find the potential energy stored between this, these two objects. Uh, this will help us use uh, energy type problems, to solve energy type problems with uh, Newton's universal law of gravitation. So let's say these two objects are originally separated by a distance r1, and I move the second one out to a distance r2 further out. So m2 here gets moved out here. And what we're going to do is we're going to use this, the definition of the change in potential energy is minus the work to move the object. So what is the work done? Our general definition for the work is the integral of the force over a displacement. In this case, we're displacing R. So what is the force between these two objects? Let's put it in. It's G M1 M2 over R squared. That's the force of gravity between the two of them. And we're integrating them between the initial position r1 and the final position r2. So I'm going to pull out the constants, which is g, m1, and m2. And 1 over r squared, I'm going to rewrite that as r to the minus 2. So what's the integral of r to the minus 2 with respect to r? That ends up being m1, m2. Ends up being minus r to the minus 1 between r1 and and R2. And we plug in our endpoints there, we end up with G M1 M2 over R2 minus G M1 M2 over R1. So we have uh, that the change of potential energy is uh, given as this change here. And we can use that to define our potential energy between two objects as minus G m1, m2 over r, where r is the separation between the two objects. So that is our definition of, uh, that is our, our derivation of the potential energy stored between those two objects. And we're going to talk about what that potential energy means. Um, one way to think about it is it's, if you look at the equation, it goes to infinity as the two objects approach each other. Right? So as they get closer and closer together, you see that it becomes more and more negative. So the, the energy becomes much, much stronger, the potential energy. It's how much, one way to think about it is if they're really, really close together, there's lots of negative potential energy. That means that it, if you want them to get away from each other, you have to spend a lot of energy. Right? The closer they are together, the more energy it's going to take to separate them. You'll notice that the potential energy is zero as R goes to infinity, right? So the potential energy goes to zero as R goes to infinity. So one way to think about it is that the potential energy is zero to infinity means that's how much energy it takes to separate them really, really far apart from each other. So here's an example here. Two asteroids, and each one is a thousand tons. Why not? They're in outer space and they're released from rest. So we're going to ask two questions here. Before that first one, we're going to say, what is the potential energy stored between this, right? So what is the potential energy here between those two things? What is the potential energy? U. 
and then b we're going to ask how fast are they moving when they collide so if we hold them far apart and we release them from rest how fast will they be moving when they collide so let's start by calculating the initial potential energy uh, between them um, okay well first let's just write down all our knowns so what are our knowns so we have that they both have the same mass right and their mass is 1,000 tons these the way it's spelled this is metric tons and one ton is 1,000 kilograms so it's 1,000 times 1,000 kilograms one ton is 1,000 kilograms so this is 1 times 10 to the 6 kilograms um, their separation we'll call it D right here they are initially separated by 100 meters and uh, they have a radius right right here and we'll talk about what that radius means in a minute but their radius is 10 meters so first let's calculate the potential energy stored between them so a potential energy is defined as minus g m1 times m2 so they're both m over the distance between them right uh, oh, let's call it d initial I'm going to call that D, D initial. So if we plug in everything, we plug in the value of G, which is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11, the two values of M, we get that the energy stored between them is about minus 0 0.6674 joules. So that's how much energy is stored. And when we release them, what's going to happen? Well, there'll be a force of gravity, and they're going to start moving towards each other. So what we want to do, so if we release them, they're going to start moving towards each other. So let's sort of draw what that looks like. So for part B, right, initially, it's like this. It's M, M, and they're a distance D initial apart from each other, right? And they're initially at rest. Final, they start moving towards each other. Final, they're going to be right on top of each other. Right when they collide, they're each going to have some velocity towards each other. Let's call it V final. Yeah, let me zoom in and draw this a little bit better. So as they get really, really close to each other, they're both going to have a velocity towards each other like this, right? V final. How far apart are they going to be right when they collide? Well, they're going to collide when their surfaces are uh, are just touching. So their final position right when they collide is going to be two times their radius, right? And we have that their radius is 10 meters. So their final distance when they right when they collide is two times the radius so it's 20 meters so we let them go and they're initially at rest how fast are they moving when they collide so let's do conservation of energy e initial equals e final so e initial would be kinetic energy initial plus potential energy initial e final would be kinetic energy final plus potential energy final well kinetic energy initial is zero because they start from rest when i release them so initially, I just have the potential energy stored between those two objects. Uh, and so that's just going to be minus G M squared over D initial. Now, kinetic energy final, there's two of them, and they're both going to have kinetic energy of one half M V final squared, right? I, I added two kinetic energies because they're both moving at the end. And... Then there's their potential energy, right? So at the end, they are separated by a distance d final, which is twice their radius. So it's going to be g m squared. And instead of d initial, it's d final. Now we want to solve this equation uh, here real quick. Uh, you'll notice that one of the m's cancels out with this one. And so we end up with minus g m over d initial. Plus, I'm going to move that gm over d final over here is equal to v final squared. So I'm isolating for v final. So if I move things around and solve for v final, I end up with v final equals, let's see, the square root of gm 1 over d final minus 1 over d initial. And when I plug in everything in there, I end up with about 0 
zero one six three meters per second. That's very slow, right? That's one point six three millimeters per second. So when I release these two objects, even though they're one thousand tons, which is one million kilograms, and they're hundred meters apart, the force of gravity is not that strong between objects that small. And so that when they collide with each other, they'll only be moving at about 1.63 millimeters per second. So here uh, is a graph of the potential energy as a function of the distance for an astronaut uh, as its distance from the center of the Earth. So remember that the astronaut's distance to the center of the Earth is r. And that's, in terms of the Earth, that's going to be the radius of the Earth plus its altitude or its height above the surface h. So you, you can write it as a mass of the Earth times the mass of the astronaut over r times g. And look at this. As, the, as you get closer and closer to the surface of the Earth, the potential energy gets more and more negative. And when it's here, right, this is how much energy is required for the astronaut to fully escape Earth's gravitational well. That's why we call it a gravitational well. It sort of looks like it's a well that's going deeper and deeper into the well the closer you get to the surface. And it's the more energy you have to spend to escape that potential well. So let's calculate the actual escape velocity for uh, here we have a turkey on the surface of the Earth. And I want to launch it with an initial speed. How much speed do I need to give it? It's initial escape velocity such that when it's really, really, really far away, it just barely comes to rest. It's just got just enough. So V final here will be zero. It's got just enough uh, energy to get to escape Earth's gravity. Um, we want to find this here, this escape velocity. So the way to do it is to start start with um, E initial equals E final. So let's write that down. So I'm going to say E initial equals E final. And E initial is of course going to be kinetic energy initial plus potential energy initial and that's going to be kinetic energy final plus potential energy final. Now at the beginning its initial kinetic energy is going to be one half times the mass of the turkey times that escape velocity squared. And the potential energy initial we use the equation for potential energy is G times the mass of the earth times the mass of the turkey over its distance. Remember, its distance from the center of the Earth is Re. And we want it to have just enough energy to completely get far away and just barely come to rest as it gets really far away. So that its kinetic energy is initially zero. And if it's really, really, really far away, as R goes to infinity, that means it's so far away that R is so large that it has essentially no potential energy left. So this makes it nice and easy. So we want to, we want to find What's the initial velocity we need to make this happen? So let's solve this for uh, V escape. So V escape, I'm going to move. Uh, you notice here that uh, I can cancel out the mass of the turkey in both cases. And we solve for V escape, and we end up with the square root of 2G mass of the Earth over the radius of the Earth. This is the energy required for the turkey to escape the surface of the Earth. Now, of course, we made a pretty big assumption here, right? If you're launching it from the surface of the Earth, obviously there's going to be drag due to air resistance. So we're ignoring air resistance, which is kind of a big deal, but this gives us an idea, and we can apply this more readily to uh, objects around uh, planets that don't have atmospheres, and it's a more accurate calculation. But this gives us a good idea of the escape velocity gives us how fast do I need to fire that turkey and you'll notice that even though it's a turkey it doesn't matter it doesn't depend on the mass of the turkey so we can use this equation to calculate the escape velocity and if you plug in various values for various planets around the solar system you see these different uh, escape velocities so for a small body like Ceres which is an asteroid the escape velocity is only 0.64 kilometers per second well, only that's still pretty damn fast, but if you launch something from the surface of this asteroid with a speed of 0.64, so 640 meters per second, it will escape. Seriously, if you want to launch it from the surface of the Earth, it would have to be moving at 11.2 kilometers per second. Now, in reality, if you launch something 11.2 kilometers per second, the air resistance, it'll catch fire and bad things will happen. But uh, that gives you an idea. 
uh, to launch from the surface of Jupiter, which is a very, very high mass. Look at that. Jupiter has a mass of uh, nearly a thousand times bigger than the Earth, and so it would be 60 kilometers per second. Uh, from the surface of the Sun, assuming the Sun itself doesn't kill it, 618 kilometers per second, right? So here it is for a couple different other stars, but this gives you an idea of what the escape velocity needs to be for various objects. So uh, this first question is pretty straightforward because we just we actually already know the answer to this one, but uh, we're going to do it um, anyways. We have a Honda Civic and we want to launch it into space because we want to show off how awesome we are. So we're going to launch our car into space. So radius of the Earth. Uh, I'm going to use 6.378. Sometimes the textbook uses a different value, but this is the one I'm going to use for now. Uh, the mass of the Earth is about 5.98 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. Uh, and, you know, the acceleration, or the uh, this constant 6.674 times 10 to the minus 11 uh, newtons meters squared per kilogram squared. So if I plug everything into here, to calculate the escape velocity, 2g mass of the Earth over Re, you get approximately, uh, we saw it before on the, on the previous page, right? 11.2 kilometers per second. It doesn't matter what you're firing from the surface, be it uh, a turkey or a, um, or a Honda Civic, the initial speed required is going to be the same. Let's look at a slightly more interesting question. Uh, here we have a kangaroo that wants to jump off an asteroid. Okay, so the asteroid has a radius of 500 kilometers, and at the surface of the asteroid, the acceleration for the uh, due to gravity for this asteroid is uh, three meters per second squared. So we're going to figure out how fast does the escape velocity need to be, and then we're going to do a couple other energy type problems with this thing. So first, let's write down everything we know. We know the radius of this asteroid. The radius of the asteroid. It's uh, 500 kilometers, which works out to about 5.00 times 10 to the 5 meters. We know uh, the uh, the acceleration due to gravity near the surface of this asteroid, right? It is 3.00 meters per second squared. Okay, so uh, this is this is sort of our unknowns, and it's asking us to find what is the initial speed need to be. Well, we don't know the mass of the asteroid. We need the mass of the asteroid to calculate this. And let's quickly find the mass of the asteroid because we have the radius and we have the acceleration due to gravity. So we, we can figure it out. So here's how we do it. We need, we need the mass of the asteroid, right, to be able to calculate the escape velocity. One way we can do it is use F equals MA. Uh, use F equals MA for the kangaroo. So kangaroo M. This is for the kangaroo. We're not going to need it, it turns out, as usual. So for the force, it's the force of gravity times the mass of the asteroid, m over r squared equals m times the acceleration. You notice that the m's go away. So I can get an expression then for the mass of the asteroid, right? So the mass of the asteroid is a r squared. And by r, it should be radius of the asteroid, right? A, a radius of the asteroid squared over g. Um, we can calculate that real quick, but I'm, uh, it, it ends up being 1.1238 1 times 10 to the 22 kilograms. But I can also just use it like this. So now that I have the mass of the asteroid, I can calculate, um, I can calculate the escape velocity, right? The escape velocity is the square root of 2g times the mass of the asteroid over the radius of the asteroid. So I'm going to plug in for the mass of the asteroid using that equation there, 2g. And if I plug in the mass of the asteroid is a r a squared over g. This has an r a. You notice that some of the stuff goes away here. That cancels out one of those. That cancels out the g, and I end up with an equation for uh, the escape velocity that is nice and simple. It is 2 times the acceleration due to gravity on the surface times the radius of the asteroid. When I plug in my numbers, I get about 1,700 meters per second. So that's kind of cool. That's the escape velocity of 
not just a kangaroo, but anything from the surface of this asteroid. So the next question it asks is, how fast is its initial neat speed? Oh, wait, no. How far from the surface will the kangaroo get if it jumps with a speed of 1,000 meters per second? So we just said that if it jumps with 1,700 meters per second, that means it will escape. It will go off to infinity. If there's no other forces, it'll escape. But if, I, if the kangaroo jumps with less than that, it'll go far away and then it'll stop and come back down. So part B is asking, well, let's imagine that it didn't jump with enough. Let's say the kangaroo only jumped with, so part B it's saying the kangaroo jumped with an initial speed like this of just 1,000 meters per second. So that's not enough, right? So this is its initial situation. And so what happens in this case is it'll go off a certain distance and then it'll stop, right? So it'll stop here because it did not jump far, it didn't, did not jump fast enough to escape the asteroid completely. So let's find out, uh, let's just find out how far from the center of gravity it's gonna go, right? So we wanna find this. How far is it gonna go our final? All right, so uh, our initial, remember our initial is just from the surface, so our initial is just the radius of the asteroid. And our final is what we wanna find. How far does it get? It starts off on the surface, how far away does it get? So we just use a conservation of energy here. Uh, so this is final. So we go E initial equals E final. So E initial is K initial plus U initial. E final is K final plus U final. So K initial is gonna be one half the mass of the kangaroo, V initial squared. And U initial is G times the mass of the asteroid times the mass of the kangaroo over the initial distance that they are apart from each other, and that's just the radius of the asteroid. And then final, because we want to know it's going to go until it stops, right? So it's going to say, we're going to say that's going to be zero, and it's going to be minus G mass of the asteroid mass of the kangaroo over our final. And you'll see that the little m's go away, as they often do in these types of questions. And I can divide, I'm going to divide both sides of this equation here by uh, negative g over m, or negative g, the mass of the asteroid. That lets us rewrite, I'm going to readjust the equation, and that lets us rewrite it as, uh, what do we have here? Let's just rewrite it as the initial squared over minus 2g m asteroid plus uh, 1 over the radius of the asteroid equals 1 over r final. So r final is going to be 1 over the left hand side, so it's going to be 1 over 1 over r a minus the initial squared over 2a m a. When I plug in all those values, I get an R final of 7.50 times 10 to the 5 meters. So that's how far it'll get from the center of the asteroid before it stops. We could also find, so that's, you know, if, if we look at it here, this is R final. This is R final right here. But remember, this part here is the radius of the asteroid, and this part here is the actual altitude above the surface that it gets. We'll call it h. So r final is equal to the radius of the asteroid plus the altitude above the surface. So if I want to know how far above the surface does it get, well, it's r final minus the radius of the asteroid. And that works out to approximately 2.5 times 10 to the five meters, okay? So if you jump, you know, the, the moral of this story is that the kangaroo jumps with a speed of 1,700 meters per second, it will escape to infinity and escape the bonds of this asteroid. But if it only jumps at 1,000 meters per second uh, here, then it will only reach uh, 250 kilometers above the surface of the asteroid. The third part to this question is, if the object is dropped from 
rest 1,000 kilometers above the surface, how fast will it be going when it hits the surface? So let, it, let us calculate that. That is a slightly different problem. Before we said what is, you know, if we launch it at 1,000 meters per second, how fast will it be going when it reaches the top? But now we're saying if it's 1,000 meters above, so it starts off here at rest, and it's 1,000 kilometers above, here it's 1,000 kilometers above. We'll call that its initial height. Initially. How fast will it be going when it hits the surface? So as we let it go, it'll start moving downwards. And when it reaches here, what is going to be its final velocity? Right? So its final height will be zero. So what is our initial? What is this initial distance? So we have its initial height. Its initial distance will be the radius of the asteroid plus h initial which works out to about 6.00 times 10 to the 5 meters. And its final height, or its final distance, is just the radius of the asteroid, because it's on the surface of the asteroid at the end. So that's just the radius of the asteroid, which is 5 times 10 to the 5 meters. What is its initial speed? Well, it starts at rest. And we're trying to find what its final velocity is going to be. So this is all used to do conservation of energy again. So we have E initial equals E final, right? Kinetic energy initial plus potential energy initial equals kinetic energy final plus potential energy final. And the one that's zero here is the initial kinetic energy because it starts at rest. So let's write down everything we know, right? It'll be minus G the mass of the asteroid times the mass of the kangaroo over its initial distance between the asteroid and the kangaroo equals one half mv final squared minus g mass of the asteroid times m over r final and the ends will all cancel and we want to solve for v final and you play around with the equations you quickly get that v final is uh, square root of 2g the mass of the asteroid 1 over r final minus 1 over r initial and plugging in our values we get approximately 1400 meters per second okay so um, that's how fast it'll be going if you release it from rest a thousand kilometers above the surface. For this problem, we have four particles, each with a mass of two kilograms on a square, in the corners of a square with side length uh, d equals three meters. And we want to find how much potential energy is stored in the system. So let's have a look at the situation. There's going to be potential energy stored between every possible pair of particles. So, for example, there will be potential energy stored. Let's, call, let's number them to help us keep track. One, two, three, four. There's going to be energy stored between one and three. They're right adjacent here, right? That's going to be the potential energy between two adjacent ones. And that potential energy just depends on the masses and the distance between them. So that will actually be the same potential energy as this, right? U adjacent between these two. And also U adjacent between these two, the, the amount of potential energy between each of these pairs, adjacent pairs, is going to be the same. But there's more, we have to look at all possible pairs. So you also have to look at the potential energy between these two here. What's the potential energy between these two? Well, the potential energy between these two is going to be uh, the potential energy between two opposite ones, which is going to be the same as the potential energy between one and four. Right? So there's also going to be a potential energy stored between these two. So the total energy stored in these four masses, it, there's like six different possible combinations, every pair. We're going to need to know how far apart these are. right? So if the distance between them is D uh, on, the, on the side, so if this, for example, from 1 to 2 is D, so this here is going to be, this distance here is going to be the square root of D squared plus D squared. So the distance between them is square root 2 of D. So, the total potential energy is going to be, there's four that are 
the same, right? It's four times the potential energy of adjacent ones. And plus there's two that are opposite corners, the kitty corner ones. Two times the potential energy of the opposite ones. Uh, the adjacent ones are all the same, so it's going to be minus g. They both have mass m, so it's just m squared over the distance. We'll call it d for now. And for the opposite ones, it's 2 times minus g m squared. And the distance between the, the opposite corners is a little bit larger than d. It's the square root 2 of d. Uh, just to make this look a little bit prettier, I'm going to factor out minus 2 g m squared over d here, and I get, uh, oh, and I end up with 2 plus 1 over square root of 2. So that's the potential energy stored between those uh, between those four objects. And if I plug in all the numbers, I end up with minus 4 point, roughly minus 4.82 times 10 to the minus 10 joules. So that's how much energy, you know, another way to think about it is, this is how much energy you would have to spend to separate those four objects so that they're far apart from each other. The second question asks, what's the potential energy if the distances are double? So if D was doubled, well, if D was doubled, all that would happen is everything else would be the same. If you look here, all these numbers would be the same. The only thing is D would become 2D. So the whole thing would be cut in half. So if I were to double the potential, the distance between them all, the potential energy would just be half of that, so it would be minus 2.41 times 10 to the minus 10, because if it's twice as far away, it's going to be half the energy. Now, let's look at a large cannon on top of a tower at the North Pole, apparently. Um, if it fires a cannonball with like a slow speed, what's the cannonball going to do? It's going to go like this, and it's going to fall down like this. If I fire it slightly harder, it'll go further and then fall down. If I fire it slightly higher, further and fall down. Now, if I fire with lots and lots of power, lots more power, initial speed, I can fire enough such that it finds its way around and comes back to the initial spot. And it could, I could fire at just the right amount, and it'll go into a circular orbit. Okay, and so that's the basic principle of, um, of something moving in a circular orbit around a planet is that it's got just enough velocity to keep to make it back down. So the entire time it's moving, right? The entire time the cannonball is moving, it's got some constant velocity in this way direction, but there's some acceleration downwards, right? A centripetal acceleration created by gravity, and it's moving in uniform circular motion around uh, the planet, in this case, Earth. And we can calculate, so this is, you know, this is a circular orbit. And we can calculate the, you know, how fast it has to go to go in a circular orbit using good old F equals ma. So I'm going to replace F with the force of gravity, g m m over, we're going to call, uh, you know, it's orbiting at some radius r squared. And uh, ma, we're going to replace a with centripetal acceleration, so it's v squared over r, we'll call it v centripetal. And if I solve this for v, solve for v, solve for v, I end up with v is equal to the square root of g m over r. It looks similar to the escape velocity equation, but it's not quite the same. That is the speed that it must have to orbit. So this would be the mass of the Earth in this case, right? An object needs to orbit with speed equal to g times the mass of the object it's orbiting divided by its radius of its orbit, that's how fast it needs to square root it. That's how fast it needs to go to stay in circular motion. So um, here you can uh, you can see the various or possible orbits here, right? If I fire it too low, it'll just hit the ground. And if I fire it a certain orbit, this will be a not a circular orbit. This is an elliptical orbit. We're going to talk about that in a second. If I fire it too hard, it'll escape, right? If I fire it hard enough, it'll escape. If I fire it at just the right speed, it'll go in a circular orbit. Um, and we showed that that, that orbital uh, velocity that's required for a certain radius is this. And we can show that the period, you know, using basically that velocity is delta x over delta t, right? We can show, and, and using delta t is the period, and delta x is 2 pi r, and using v orbit is this, 
we can show that the period, how long it takes to orbit around the Earth once, is 2 pi r to the 3 halves over the square root of gme. Um, and we, we notice that if we look at things orbiting the sun, uh, this the orbital speed, if you look at the equation, the orbital speed, so the, the, you know, for orbiting the sun, any for the planets orbiting the sun, uh, it depends on the mass of the sun and how far they are from the sun. And it's it, go, it follows a 1 over the square root of r uh, distribution. And when you plot it, when you plot the actual speeds, the orbitals, how fast they're moving, uh, you see that they follow this 1 over the square root of r time, type behavior as you get further away from the sun, right? Mars, oh, that shouldn't be Mars, that should be Mercury right here, that's Mercury, uh, is moving very fast, and as you get further and further out, their orbital speeds slow down. Now, Johannes Kepler developed these three laws of planetary motion. I'm just sort of going to mention them and describe their, uh, their implications briefly, and then we'll show how they're consistent with our current understanding of physics, but uh, back in the, uh, you know, back in the early 1600s, he developed these three laws just based on observation. He didn't have any physical uh, underlying principles for these things. He just looked at the behavior of planets and observations and came up with a set of rules that describe the behaviors of all these planets. He said that all planets move in elliptical orbits with the sun at one focus. We'll talk about what an elliptical and a focus is again if you remember your geometry we'll review that in a second he said that the law of areas that a line connects a planet to the sun so here's a planet a line connecting the planet to the sun sweeps out equal areas in the planet planet's orbit in equal time intervals that is da dt and which sweeps out the area is constant so if this is like over one month then this area swept out by the planet and the line is equal to if this is one month this area and this area will be equal to each other, according to uh, Kepler's uh, second law. Kepler's third law is he found a relationship between the square of the period, you know, so for the Earth it would be 365 days to all go all the way around the Sun, is directly related to the semi-major axis, which is, we'll talk about that in a second, it's the, uh, it's sort of an average of the radius of the, it's related to the radius of the, the orbit of the, of the planet. So he found this relationship between the period and the orbital radius. So let's look at them individually real quick. So first, uh, an eclipse, or an ellipse, not an eclipse. Eclipse is for an astronomy class. Uh, here is an ellipse, all right? An elliptical orbit is like a, looks like a squished um, circle, and there are usually two focal points here, and the way our orbits work is that the, the way we orbit the, the sun or objects orbit the earth is to a really good approximation, you place, let's say, the sun at one of the focal points and the distance from, and this blue line represents the orbit here, okay, and so the, the, the length from the longest part here from one end to the other of the ellipse is equal to two times the semi-major axis. So the semi-major axis goes from the center to the very far end and from the center to the very far end here. There's A. And a measure of how squished this, uh, el this ellipse is is called the eccentricity. When the eccentricity is zero, it ends up being equal to, it ends up being circular. And as the eccentricity gets larger and larger, this ellipse, you know, so this would be something with an eccentricity of zero, right? Because it's circular. And something with a very large eccentricity that'll be uh, much much greater than zero so eccentricity is between zero and one so this is a large eccentricity and a small eccentricity so a planet with a mass m moving around elliptical orbit around the sun you treat the sun as being at one of the foci focal points and um, and then this distance here is the closest approach of the object to the to the sun and this distance here is the uh, farthest distance to the sun. Uh, just to give you an idea of what the orbits are for our planets in our solar system, right? The eccentricity of the Earth is 0 0.02. It's pretty circular. It's not perfectly circular, but it's close. Mercury is a very high eccentricity, right? But it's still relatively very circular, but uh, not nearly as circular as most of the other planets, of all the other planets. And for comparison, I put in Halley's Comet, which is a highly, highly elliptical orbit, 
and that's going to uh, that's going to have eccentricity of 0.97. This just give you an idea of how uh, how circular the orbits are for um, for objects orbiting the sun. Now Kepler's second law said that the change in the area over time is a constant. And just a quick derivation of it. Since the area is one half base times height, here's here's the area here, and if it moves a small d theta angle as it moves around the sun, then we can approximate the little area swept out over a small amount of delta theta as half base times height. So a half base, which is uh, r theta times height, which is r. Right. So r theta, be, r delta theta, because it's like the uh, the arc length, more or less. It's an it's an approximation. One half r squared delta theta. Now we're going to divide this by delta t and then approximate it delta a over delta t as dA dt. So now one half r squared d theta over dt. Then the d theta over dt that's just the definition of angular velocity. So it becomes one half r squared times the angular velocity. Then we use our definition of angular momentum. Angular momentum is uh, r times the momentum times the sine of the angle between them, which is 90 degrees in this case, so it just becomes r times p. p is mv. I'm going to rewrite v in terms of angular momentum, so I can write the angular momentum as m r squared times the angular velocity. So that lets us write this. It lets us write that the dA dt is the angular momentum over 2m, and this is a constant. The angular momentum is a constant value, right? So it's sort of a statement of the conservation of angular momentum of something as it orbits the sun. All right, so the rate of change of the area with respect to time is a constant value that depends on the angular momentum. Uh, a derivation for the third law, basically that relationship between the period and the uh, the orbit. It's very simple. We start with f equals ma. We replace f with g m m over r squared. We replace a uh, in terms of, not for centripetal acceleration, but we rewrite a in terms of angular velocity. So that should be angular velocity. And we plug in for the angular velocity, and then we, uh, for the angular velocity here, we write in terms of the period. So the angular velocity is equal to 2 pi over t squared. And I'm going to move t to one side and all the r's to the other side. And I know with this equation here that the period squared is equal to these constants times the radius cubed. And and the radius is for circular orbit. For non-circular, it will be the semi-major axis. The semi-major axis ends up being just the radius of the orbit. And so this is the relationship between the period of the orbit and the uh, semi-major axis, or roughly uh, the radius of the orbit. And so that's a, sort of a statement of Kepler's law in terms of modern physics principles. And if you calculate this equation for various um, values for something orbiting the sun, you see that they all work out to be pretty similar to each other. t squared over r cubed all ends up being very close to what is predicted by this equation. So it's a good description of the relationship between them. So let's do a simple calculation to show this, uh, to practice sort of understanding how uh, ellipse, uh, ellipses work. So let's say I have a satellite that's moving in an elliptical orbit So around the Earth. So here's the Earth red for some reason, and here uh, can be the radius of the Earth. And it's it's orbiting such that its furthest point from the Earth is 360 kilometers above the Earth's surface. So this here, oops, this here is its point when it's at the furthest, so we'll call that its height when it's the furthest, that's 360 kilometers, and then it's going in an orbit, and then its height where it's closest here is, we're told, is 180 kilometers. So this is the orbit. And remember, the radius of the Earth is six, roughly 6,378 kilometers. So it's asking the, for the semi-major axis. So let me rewrite this in terms of um, in terms of an ellipse. So let me draw my ellipse again. So here's the ellipse of the orbit. And there's two focal points, right? F. And we're going to treat the Earth as being right here. So we're going to treat the Earth as being a point right here. And for, by the definition of an ellipse, this here is the center, right? Right here, this is the center. 
And as we saw in the diagram before, this is the eccentricity times A. This distance here is the eccentricity times A. And then this distance here is the radius of the Earth plus HE. Then this distance here is also the radius of the Earth plus E. So this is the radius of the Earth plus H, not HE, H uh, close. So uh, I'm just rewriting the ellipse in terms of some things we can sort of compare the eccentricity and the total um, and, and the total distances. So uh, another thing to remember is that this distance from one end to the other is a. The distance from here to here is also a. So one way to calculate the eccentricity is that the total distance from one end to the other to a is the sum of all those distances, right? So it's the radius of the Earth plus the h closest plus, um, and so this distance here will be the radius of the Earth plus h farthest. So we just want to solve for a. So a is going to be equal to 2 times the radius of the Earth plus hc plus hf all over 2. I'm going to plug everything into there. I get that the semi-major axis is 6.648 times 10 to the 6 meters. Then I ask for the eccentricity. That's for just that's for the uh, semi-major axis. For the eccentricity, uh, there, let's see, we, we can use the same equation, but we're going to use different values. So it's, or we're going to use slightly different equations. So that total distance from one end to the other is also going to be equal to RE plus HC times 2 plus E times A times 2. Okay, uh, so that's just adding this plus this plus this plus this all adds up to e times a. So now I'm going to solve for a. So a, no, I want to solve for the eccentricity. It's a measure of how warped this ellipse is. So when I solve it, I end up with, play around with it, you can get to here. Uh, and so that gave me an answer of 0 0.0135. So pretty low eccentricity. It's very close to circular. So this is just a little bit of geometry, um, but let's get to sort of more physics-y stuff here. Here, what does the speed of a satellite need to be such that it orbits the Earth at an altitude of 2,000 kilometers? So we're going to go back to an equation we derived earlier. Remember the orbital speed required to orbit something? It's g times the mass of the Earth over r. So we can use that. So uh, what are our knowns? Well, the mass of the Earth is known. It's 5.98 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. We have the radius r of the orbit. It's just 2,000 kilometers, which is 2.00 times 10 to the 6 meters. Well, that's not the radius of the orbit. That's the altitude. That's how far it is above the surface. The actual radius of the orbit, remember, is just as a reminder draw it slightly bigger. The actual radius of the orbit, so if this is the h here, and this is the radius of the Earth, remember the radius of the orbit is actually the distance from the center of the Earth to there. r is going to be h plus re. So r is going to be re plus h, which works out to approximately 8.378 times 10 to the 6 meters. And uh, just as a friendly reminder, g is 6.674 times 10 to the minus 11 newtons meters squared per kilogram squared. So for a, calculating the speed is just v equals the square root of g me over r. So when I plug in all those numbers, I get that in order to move in order to be able to orbit, that's the speed that's required, about 6.9 kilometers per second is how fast a satellite has to be to orbit the Earth 2,000 kilometers above its surface. Uh, what is the period? Well, we have that equation here for, for part 
uh, B, we can use this, right? Let's solve that for T. So T is equal to all this stuff, 4 pi squared over G times the mass of the Earth, not the Sun in this case, uh, A cubed, all to the 1 half, or all square rooted. When I plug that in, I get a bunch of seconds. Uh, 7,626.8 seconds roughly, which works out to about 2.1 hours. Just to give you an idea, so if it's orbiting at that speed, it will have an orbital radius of 2.1 hours. That's the speed it has to go. Well, this next problem is, what altitude does a satellite need so that it can be in geosynchronous orbit, and how fast is it going? So the big question is, what is geosynchronous orbit? Well, geosynchronous orbit means that it is moving around, let's say it's equatorial, so along the equator, around the Earth, it is moving along so that it stays at the same point above the Earth as the Earth. So it's rotating around the Earth at the same speed that the Earth is rotating. So it's, it's always above the same point on the ground. So that means that its period of oscillation is going to be 24 hours for geosynchronous orbit. And uh, 24 hours works out to about 8, 86,400, or works out to exactly 86,400 seconds. So, what altitude does it need for that? So let's use, you know, that's, that's going to be for part A. So let's use Kepler's third law and solve for R. Uh, you know, we're just going to let A equal R here because it's circular. Circular orbit, the semi-major axis is the same as the, uh, as the radius of the orbit. So if I solve for R, I end up with T squared G mass of the Earth over 4 pi squared all to the one third. When I plug in everything into there, I end up with about 4.23 times 10 to the 7 meters. So that's how high, that's the radius of its orbit. If I wanted the altitude above the surface, Right, so remember the altitude above the surface, so r is going to be the radius of the Earth plus its altitude. So the altitude would be um, uh, the radius or of the orbit minus the radius of the Earth, which works out to about 3.59 times 10 to the 7 meters, is how far above. Uh, how far above the uh, the Earth's surface it needs to be to be in geosynchronous orbit, and this is something we do do with satellites. That works out to about three five nine kilometers above the Earth, and that's how far roughly they have to be in order to uh, orbit geosynchronously. Uh, Phobos, Martian satellite, so it's one of the moons of, of Mars, travels at a, uh, an approximately circular orbit of radius. 9.4 times 10 to the 6 meters, okay? And it's orbiting with an orbital period of 7 hours and 39 minutes. And we can use that to calculate the mass of Mars. That's a totally legitimate way to get a calculation for the mass of Mars. Because if you look at this equation, right, it depends on the period, the mass of the thing that you're orbiting. So in this case, it'll be the mass of Mars and the orbital radius. So, or... or semi-major axis. So we're trying to find the mass of Mars, or at least an estimate of the mass of Mars. Uh, but before we do that, let's quickly convert that time to um, seconds. So seven hours, we convert that, you know, 60 minutes in one hour plus 39 minutes. I want to convert this to minutes first. So uh, that works out to 459 minutes when you add that. As you notice that here the hours cancel out, we end up with 7 times 60 plus 39. Now I want to convert that to seconds. Uh, so 60 seconds in one minute. And you'll see that the minutes go away. We get that the approximate period is 27540 seconds. So now let's use Kepler's third law. So t squared equals 4 
pi squared over g, and then in this case we do the mass of Mars uh, times r squared. So let's solve for the mass of Mars. Solve for mass of Mars. So mass of Mars equals 4 pi squared over g times the period squared times the radius cubed. When you plug in all the values, you get about 6.48 times 10 to the 21 kilograms, which is an approximate measurement of the mass of Mars. Oops, I made a slight miscalculation there. That should be 10 to the 23. So that's approximately correct. So you could just, uh, using telescopes, you could try to measure the, uh, the period of the orbit of Phobos around Mars, and then uh, find some other way to measure the orbit of that radius, and you could use that to estimate the mass of Mars. So next, what I'd like to do is something slightly different. Um, I'm going to calculate the total energy of an object in orbit. So if I have some planet and I have an object in orbit around it, what is its total energy, right? Um, it's going to have a velocity and it's going to have, so it's going to have kinetic energy and potential energy. What I'd like to do is figure out the total energy of an object in orbit around the sun or around any other object. So uh, let's start with F equals MA. So if I have F equals MA, uh, I'm going to plug in for F as usual G M M over R squared. And for MA, I'm going to do M V squared over R. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply both sides of this because I want to make it look like kinetic energy. I'm going to multiply both sides by r over 2 of this equation. And so I end up with the left side, I end up with g m m over 2 r, and the right hand side is 1 half m v squared. And that's just the kinetic energy, right? That's the kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy of an object orbiting another object is g m m over 2 r, which is kind of handy. I can also use that to calculate the total energy. So the total energy, remember, is kinetic energy plus potential energy. So kinetic energy is GMM over 2R. And potential energy we, we uh, calculated as G minus GMM over 2R, over R, sorry, not over 2R, it's over R. So if I subtract those two others, then the total energy of the system is always is going to be negative here. It's going to be minus GMM over 2r. Uh, that's an interesting result is that the total energy and the kinetic energy uh, are sort of equal and opposite. But the total energy is a negative number. That's because there's negative potential energy, right? So this total energy is the potential energy plus the kinetic energy. So this is how much energy is still required for it to escape. Even if it's already moving, it's still in orbit. It's still bound to the object. So until you give it enough kinetic energy to escape the object, um, it's still bound, but uh, so that's the total energy and that's the kinetic energy. And uh, here's sort of a, a plot of all three of those things. There's the kinetic energy. As it's moving closer, it's moving faster, so it has more kinetic energy. As it's orbiting closer to the, the surface of the planet, the total energy here is the sum of this potential energy plus this kinetic energy. Now, uh, a couple fun little uh, problems here. Two satellites, A and B, both have mass of 125 kilograms. So let's write down everything here. They both have a mass of 125 kilograms, and they have an or they are both orbiting at an orbital radius of 7.87 times 10 to the 6 meters around the Earth. And we know the mass of the Earth already. Uh, so it says, what's the total mechanical energy of these two satellites? They're, they're moving in opposite directions of the same orbit, so they're going to collide at some point. But first, before they collide, what is their total energy? Well, their total energy before they collide is just their individual energies, right? And since they have the same orbital radius, they have the same energy, right? It's, it's, they're both going to have energy G, M, E, M of the object over 2R. When you calculate that, it ends up being minus 6.35 times 10 to the 9 joules. So what happens when they collide? So 
when they collide, they both have exact equal and opposite momentum in opposite directions. So they're going to just clump into one big object. So when they collide, they're going to clump into one big object. And they're going to, so here's Earth. And here's an object now that has a mass 2m and is at rest. Um, and it's just going to, they're going to clump together and then fall down. So they no longer have kinetic energy, but they're going to have, they're going to have combined potential energy together. So their total energy it's just going to be it's one object right so it's going to be minus g m e times the mass of that new object which is 2m over 2r so the total energy is the same it's just that the kinetic energy got is sort of potential energy now okay so um so that is the total energy of that clump out and what's going to happen after they well they're going to they're going to sort of fall down towards the center towards the earth uh, next question, an asteroid with a mass of 1 times 10 to the 20 kilograms is in a circular orbit at a radius of 2 AU. An AU is an astronomical unit. It's the average distance astron astronomical unit. And 1 AU is equal to uh, 1.496 times 10 to the 11 meters. That's the average distance of the Earth from the Sun. And uh, so it's an asteroid has a mass of 1 times 10 to the 20 kilograms is in a circular orbit at a radius of 2 AU from the Sun. So uh, from the Sun. So it's orbiting the Sun. I should have mentioned that. Orbits the Sun. So what is the period of revolution? Well the period of revolution is I'm going to use good old T squared equals 4 pi squared over g mass of the sun a cubed, right? So I'm going to use 4 pi squared over g times the mass of the sun um, times r cubed. And so r r in this case is 2 au, which works out to about 2.992 times 10 to the 11 meters and the mass of the Sun uh, I'll always give that to you if you need it it's about 1.984 times 10 to the 30 kilograms so if I plug that into here for the period I get approximately 7.311 times 10 to the 7 seconds which works out to about 730 days so about two years roughly. Um, so that's the period for this uh, this asteroid to orbit the Sun. It's asking what is its kinetic energy? Well its kinetic energy we saw before, right? Kinetic energy is uh, G M M, uh, well mass of the Sun, over two times that radius and that has a kinetic energy of about 2.22 times 10 to the 28. 2.22 times 10 to the 28 joules. It's a lot of energy. So that's just a little bit of fun information there. Uh, this problem here is uh, we have a satellite in a circular orbit of planet X. And uh, its orbital radius is 2.20 times 10 to the 7 meters. Okay, And the force on the satellite due to the gravity is 88 newtons. Okay, that's our knowns. And it's asking, what's the kinetic energy of the satellite? Well, a couple ways we can go about doing this. Um, a says kinetic energy. So, well, let's, let's just do this. Kinetic energy is G M right here. Let's let's do it this way. Kinetic energy is one half m v squared. Now we don't know the mass of the uh, satellite. We don't know the uh, velocity, but we can figure a lot of this stuff out using a nice little shortcut. Uh, F equals MA. And we've done this one before. So F equals MA, uh, MV squared over R, right? I'm replacing A with the centripetal acceleration. So I can solve that for V squared. And V squared is equal to force times R over M. What's nice about that? So if I plug this into here, 
I get rid of the m, which I don't know anyways. So I end up with one half m uh, f r over m. That cancels out the m, and it only depends on f r, and I can calculate that, right? Because I know the force of gravity. It's 88 newtons. I know the radius of the orbit. So that ends up being uh, 9.68 times 10 to the 8 joules. It's kind of handy little trick com combining all these different units that we know about, or these different quantities to figure out what we want. Second part says, what's the force due to the planet if the radius were 4 times 10 to the 7 instead of 2.2 .2 times 10 to the 7? So we have, you know, we have R and F. So we, just as a reminder, we have R is 2.2 .2 times 10 to the 7 meters, and F is 88 newtons and it's asking what if what if r were r prime and instead it were 4.0 times 10 to the 7 meters what is the force in that case well what we can do is a it's a good old-fashioned ratio so remember f is equal to g m m over r squared and f prime is g m m over r prime squared and so that's equation one, and that's equation two. If I do equation two divided by equation one, I end up with f prime over f equals gmm over r prime squared over gmm over r squared, which gives me f prime is equal to f times r over r prime squared. Because you notice a lot of this stuff cancels out, right? And when I plug in all my values there, I get that the force is 26.6 newtons, which makes sense. The further away the satellite is from the planet, the weaker the force is.